now. This is your last chance to be bad before you make those New Year's resolutions. That's why we call our celebration New Year's Evil. Holiday slashers have been done to death, yet there are only a few that have persevered into annual traditions. And New Year's has been an often ignored holiday. But back in 1980, a slasher release that had a fairly interesting premise. A radio DJ gets a series of threatening phone calls claiming they'll commit a murder at the stroke of midnight in different time zones and end with the DJ herself on the West Coast. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, poor execution kept this from being a genre staple. Sure, there are some cool ideas here, but it's in a very weird package. So today on Real Slashers, let's drop the ball on New Year's Evil. I'm going to commit Murder at midnight. I'm going to kill someone you know. Hailing to us from the Canon Group, the same company that made all of those terrible movies from the 80s and 90s, it'd be easy to judge this right off the bat in a negative light. Especially when the film starts with an absurd, awkward zoom into a Holiday Inn. Oof. But hey, so long as it's got some killings, then a slasher can do whatever it wants with its opening. And we certainly get an opening kill, even if it's pretty tame. But we quickly get into the whole premise of the film. A mysterious caller dials up DJ Diane Sullivan, otherwise known as Blaze, who's hosting a New Year's Eve special. And let me tell you, this woman must be the coolest person in the world based on how these folks react to her. And this murderer claims that he's going to kill a different person every time the clock strikes midnight in the various time zones. This helps to establish some tension, as every death is like a ticking time bomb getting closer and closer to Diane's demise. Unfortunately, Diane isn't exactly likable, and especially with how she treats her son, it's easy to see why anyone would want to kill this lady. Oh yeah, and her son Derek you might recognize as Grant Kramer from Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Here he plays a role that I can't quite get my head around, but more on that later. There are times here where the music is very awkward, but it kind of adds to the charm. Take the entire credit sequence, where these people are just rocking out to hair metal as they drive down Hollywood Boulevard. And take note of this girl who is holding this champagne bottle like she's going to clock someone over the head with it. This isn't usually something that I notice in movies, but the makeup in this film is ridiculous. Look at all these people. I get that Blaze has a persona, but she's definitely ripping off some David Bowie here. Unlike other slashers, we get to see a bit of the killer's process even. Sure, we don't know his identity until the end, but he's in full view most of the movie. It's humorous to see him getting frustrated as midnight gets closer, so he has to make a change so that he can make what he said come true. He's got a schedule, damn it. Hell, there's a whole aside where he accidentally hits some bikers and then gets chased by them into a drive-in theater. Thankfully, this allows them to use one of the bikers for his mountain time kill. A man of God, not a man of violence. <laughs> oh, so good. While most killers seem to get their victim no matter what, Evil pursues this drive-in girl only for her to get away. More films need to have things not go according to plan than the killer adjusting. It makes the progression of events feel a lot more realistic. But for every time they do something right like this, they completely fumble the ball with other logic leaps like the cops locking down the building, only for one of the cops to get knocked out and for this to somehow not raise any red flags. Hell, they even say that the killer is in the building, yet they don't try to get her out of there in any kind of hurry. That killer could be loose in this building somewhere. Understand? While the rest of the film is fairly creative, I'd even struggle calling it a slasher at points, the ending often follows the more formulaic route. But we'll save that one for slicing up a scene. We've got a killer to reveal. Happy New Year to you, Blaze! As much as the killer, evil, is a mystery, this isn't exactly a whodunit. 
we see him making the phone calls to Diane and committing these murders. Hell, he's practically the lead. I love when he's in his dumb priest outfit. The only mystery is who the hell this guy is. He even uses a voice modulator to change his, you know, voice, despite us seeing him the entire film. But there's a purpose to this, and it all becomes clear once it's revealed to be Diane's husband. Yeah, she obviously would have recognized his voice, hence the modulator. But his motivations aren't exactly great. This has been a very bad year for me. But if you were hoping for a recognizable killer, evil doesn't really fit the bill. Richard Sullivan is simply in regular clothes during most of the film, and doesn't even try to conceal his identity. This works because it plays more on how a real-life serial killer operates. Even the people that he dresses up as. A doctor and a priest, two people that you usually think you can trust. Though the moment he finally wears a mask just made me want him to have it during the rest of the film. It looks sweet. At least put it on for the murders themselves. Why go through the trouble of designing such a cool mask if you're hardly going to use it? The kills here also aren't anything to write home about, but there is a level of tension that I enjoy. Just look at the opening murder. This girl's in her hotel room and it seems like someone is trying to break into her room, only for the killer to appear from the shower. That same shower that she had blindly reached into to try and shut off the dripping water earlier. It's little moments like this that work well, and I wish that were more frequent. Instead, we're in the killer's shoes for these moments, though that works really well too. It's what takes this away from just standard slasher fare. And one element I really enjoy is how evil torments Blaze, both by saying that she'll be the final victim, but also by playing the audio of the kills themselves. In fact, the dude seems like he'd be upset if he wasn't able to record the murders. How this man acts from one moment to another really solidifies how wackadoo he is. Though the man can make magic with an elevator circuit board. Now you're trying to do the same thing with our son, and I will not stand for it. What do you mean, Richard? Oh, he told me. We had a very interesting discussion while waiting for you. The whole ending is full of questionable choices. A cop almost shooting Diane's son, Derek, because she forgot he was in there. Or how evil manages to control the elevator like he has a remote control, despite it looking like this. The reveal of the husband being the killer is pretty well done. We followed Richard this entire time, so to see Diane react kindly to his presence is a nice flip on what we've seen the entire movie. Because most of the people don't see Richard as a threat because they don't know him. Yet Diane, who's on edge and would react negatively to a stranger, is completely relieved when it's revealed to be Richard. It's a confusing moment because it goes against what you expect to happen, yet makes sense in almost the same breath. It is very well done, but they don't really manage the rest of the ending in a satisfying way. He explains he's mad at her for neglecting their son and showing too much attention to other men. He quickly ties her to the elevator and it feels like a missed opportunity. Seems like the man who did all of this to kill his wife would want to actually participate more, you know, hands-on with her murder. This feels a little Bond villain to me. Then, as soon as he's cornered, he completely shits the bed. He jumps off the building and commits suicide. This leaves his poor son Derek to cry over his body. Given all that he's done this entire film up to this point due to how Diane treated their son, you'd think that he'd want to be there for him. So was his plan always going to end with him killing himself? Doesn't seem like he thought that one through, or maybe it was just the writers that didn't think it through. And yes, the ending makes some sense of this by having Derek take the mantle from his father by donning the mask. I love that we don't see him kill his mother, but with the radio announcing the stroke of midnight, I would say all signs point to yes. This is where the film manages to be very clever, but getting there is just full of stupid. Derek taking over for his father makes a lot of sense, but him having the mask within a full view of all these spectators certainly doesn't. And you would think that Derek would be a bit upset with his father who just left him by committing suicide, but hey, who am I to judge? You need a crack and stop it! Shut up, bitch! You just tell the cops that I took out the trash from my last party. New Year's Evil released in the United States on December 19th, 1980, and has no financial totals to speak of. With a budget of just half a million dollars, you'd think that they'd have made their money back, 
but with Canon and their just, let's just say, unique way of releasing films, it wouldn't surprise me if this movie made more in video rentals than it ever did theatrically. Scream Factory would release a version of the movie on Blu-ray in 2015, but that would go quickly out of print, not having the audience for it. Thankfully, Kino Lorber stepped in to finally put the film out in a respectable Blu-ray in 2022. Without a memorable killer or even a memorable weapon, New Year's Evil has mostly been forgotten. And I can't say I'm very surprised given its strange tone and lack of following the formula, but the concept is so much fun and more unique than most other slashers of that era that I really wish we could see a remake of this one. There's a fascinating film in here that's just hampered by a lack of budget and resources. Can you imagine a better filmmaker taking this and doing the same concept, only, you know, putting some brains behind it? Maybe with the recent release of Thanksgiving and that success, we'll maybe see some of these other holidays start to be revisited in the same way that other holidays were visited at the same time as Halloween's release. But maybe I'm just getting ahead of myself, and maybe we just need to appreciate the ones that we have. Happy New Year, Zevil. Heh. <laughs>